Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Bank Resort at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com to start planning your weekend getaway. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and today is Emily's very first time to record here on our podcast. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So people will remember um, Emma, our, our regular listeners know Emma. Well, Emma has gone, she did so many commercials for UT Martin that she ended up working there in social media. But the nice thing is she sent her roommate, Emily. Emily's actually Emma's roommate. So it, it's so she was, she must not have said too bad of things about us. No, she had all great things to say. <laughs> oh, I, Absolutely. That's great. Okay. Well, as everybody knows, before we start talking to our really uh, fun guests we have today, first of all, I want to know something that you, Emily, have discovered at Discovery Park of America recently. So I learned something really cool about our Southern Artist Showcase, the Caldwell Collection, on my way to the office the other day. All of the artists that are featured in this rotation are self-taught, meaning that they had little or no formal art education. That's excellent. And that whole exhibit is right outside of our door here. And so I get to look at it frequently. Um, so that's a really good discovery. Uh, today, we're going to discover a lot more when we chat with Mr. Dan Knowles. He is a superstar in so many different areas, and he's going to tell us all the areas. But, but what I know so far is he makes stringed instruments, he plays the banjo, he paints murals, he's a sculptor, a teacher, a writer. I could go on and on. He is a true Renaissance man. Welcome, Dan. Well, thank you for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. So before we talk about all of your interesting things that you're um, working on, tell me a little bit about where'd you come from? Or where's your, what's your history? Oh, Lord, that's a long thing. You know, when you get to be my ancient age, it, uh, this could take all day just doing this part. I know the feeling. I was um, born in Glendive, Montana. My father was a... Um, Baptist preacher and a, uh, millwright. And so we traveled a lot and, uh, our people come from down in, uh, Northern Georgia around Tacoa area. And so almost immediately from my birth, we went to Tacoa, stayed there and in South Carolina till I moved to California in the third grade, stayed in California until 1984. When I came to Tennessee to work for the gospel group, acapella, as a uh, recording engineer, and I've been here ever since. Wow, that's fascinating. So, um, <laughs> y did when you when you were young, uh, when you were just starting out, what what uh, path did you think you wanted to go down? I thought I'd be a commercial artist. Actually, um, that that was when I went to college and everything. That was where I was headed, and uh, I found out that I didn't like to do lettering all that much. And in the good old days, that was what you did. You didn't have a computer to do the, the work for you. And so I got a chance to go on the road playing music, and that's what happened. So so growing up, you were a musician and an artist both. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. In high school, where, where were your, uh, in, your interests? Were you mostly the music or art? Uh, mostly the art. I played music, um, but no, it, it was mostly art. And I was very fortunate in that the schools in California had good art programs in high school and in junior high school. And uh, so I was able to train with some really good people. And what at, at what point... The lettering, I'm assuming since you were doing lettering, were you majoring in graphic design at first? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I was the same and, way. I started off in graphic design and, you know, we had to use rub on letters. I don't know if y'all had, had <laughs> I remember <that>. those. <laughs> Letraset. I think they were called Letrasets. And <laughs> different places that I would work would give away the extra ones. So, like, you know, there would be a whole sheet with like maybe two capital X's on it. And so, you know, or so we would, you know, get to use those for our own personal work. And I remember, you know, you know, rubbing on headlines and stuff. Where did you go? <laughs> 
I went to school out in California, um, went to Modesto High School, and then I did three years just nearly private study with a guy named Dan Peterson, who is a great watercolorist out in California. And um, Dan is really who, as far as my artwork is concerned, actually, all of my creative work is concerned. I learned so many things from him. He had loads of little rules and sayings and things like that, like uh, the rule of three or the God is in the details and, and things of that nature. And um, interesting little side note to that right there is that uh, it's been about two years ago. Now I was on the Cumberland river working on the queen of the Mississippi and I'd gotten done with the show and I sell these little two and a quarter by two and a quarter refrigerator magnets that I hand paint and on the river boats, they're primarily steamboats and things of that nature. And uh, anyway, this guy comes up and he buys one of the magnets. And he said to me, he said, he said, this is really good work. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, well, I know what I'm talking about. He said, I'm an artist. And I said, oh, well, good. So I looked down at his name tag and it said, Daniel Peterson, Rip in California. I said, did you teach art? He said, yes. I said, did you teach him Modesto? He said, yes. I said, oh my God. My wife had come, Debbie had come on with me on the boat that night and had had an allergy attack to some of the stuff that sprayed around in the showroom. And so she'd gone up on the sky deck to, to kind of survive it. And, uh, so I told Dan, I said, you stand right here. I said, don't move. I said, I'll be right back. I ran upstairs and I grabbed Debbie and brought her down so she could meet him. I hadn't seen this man for 40, 50 years, whatever it's been. Wow. And, um, we've been in, in close contact ever since. And it, it's been such, such a treat to, to have had that happen. It's, it's interesting to hear, you know, how, how a mentor made such a huge difference, um, in your life and how you ran into him again. Um, I know he was probably impressed with all the things that you are doing. Um, would you like to know, would you like to know the truth? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We've, we've laughed about this a bunch. Uh, he doesn't remember me from school. Wow. He says, he says, you must've been one of my good ones. And I said, no, I wasn't one of your good ones. I just, I just stayed there and learned it. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? So I guess those those folks that are out there teaching, you, they never know where their uh, impact is going to be. No, you don't. You really don't. And you know, it, it it always surprises me in my own teaching into my profession when people come back to me or I hear something secondhand that I've done something really special for them. And I'm like, really? (laughs) I didn't realize that. (laughs) It's very, it it feels good though. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so now tell me a little bit about how you ended up, where, where is your home now? I know you're in Northwest Tennessee, but where is your home now? Do you want my address? No, no, your region. (laughs) We don't want people coming to your house. I don't care. My my house gallery. My house is like a gallery. Okay. Um, I could wander you around and show you the place, but uh, it uh, there's, I don't know how many paintings are in the house right now. And we've got shows, two shows running that my work is in. And, um, and the house is still full of mess. So <laughs> and you're in, it's, are you outside of Paris or in Paris? I'm right or? downtown okay. near the Paris Academy for the arts. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if you were, um, in Paris. Um, of course, Paris, Tennessee, not everybody who listens to our podcast is from around here. So, uh, we are not discussing Paris, France. We're talking about Paris, Tennessee. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, you know, it's fun when I'm out on, on the river and I'll with sitting with guests, they'll say, well, where are you from? And I'll say Paris <laughs> yeah. and they'll get excited. And it's like, you came all the way from Paris to do this show. And I'll say, yes, I did. You know, <laughs> Tennessee. 
So we're going to talk about your banjo work in a minute, or your banjo skill, your banjo talent. I don't know how to say it, but first, I want to talk a little bit more about your art. Um, what what are you? And I know that you know most people who do art kind of evolve and change in their work. You know what what type of work, what type of painting are you creating now? Uh, it depends on really where I'm at painting. And what I'm doing, if I'm doing the public work, which is what I consider my mural work, that that is one whole lifetime. And my private work is is a different thing. My background, which this might be helpful to you in that respect, is um, the artist that influenced me the most was Salvador Dali. And so when and there have been several Salvador. Um, Maxfield Parrish, oddly enough, as an illustrator, and Jackson Pollock and George Seurat are the th- are the four kind of touchstones for me. And um, I spent probably fifteen years painting nothing but pointillism and doing everything from real small pieces to great big pieces. But the pointillist work all really came out of the surreal because one of the things that I maintain on a regular basis is I keep a, uh, a drawing pad next to my bed and I keep a dream diary and I work at tapping that unconscious side of myself all the time because it it's really, it's really where my heart's at. And it's funny because I was looking at this latest mural and, and actually looking back through all the murals I've done in this area. And um, even though it's not surreal, it's very surreal. And so, so I noticed that I, I believe it's the 24th mural that was recently uh, unveiled the, and, and I didn't right. know if you had worked on all of them or, you know, how many of them you had worked on. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that, pro- that whole project in Paris. Well, the project, it's called the back alley Paris project. And, um, it was developed by the city fathers with the idea of restoring the downtown alleys. And that was really what they wanted to do. Because when I first moved to Paris, these alleys were They were really bad. And um, so they partnered up with several state agencies to get the uh, the grants to be able to do it. And and my my knowledge of all the earlier grants that had to do with construction and stuff is pretty limited. But um, the alley projects that I've been involved with, I guess it's been about six years or so ago, they had had excuse me, at least two other artists that I know of that were, were doing some artwork and, um, with various levels of success. And they approached me because I have painted large my whole life. And it's really kind of funny the way it turned out because, uh, Kathy Ray is the lady. She was over the uh, DPA at the time. She approached me and she asked me if I would do some murals on these windows it was going to be called the windows in the west alley and my first thought was no i don't want to do this you know i only get to work in the winter time and it's here and all that and i have a real good friend of mine the artist uh john monroe and john's in his mid 80s and was living in really destitute poverty and so i thought well i'll take these on to give John some work. And that was really my whole thought with the thing. And, and then he ended up getting sick in the middle of the project and I ended up painting most of them, which is all right. But, um, anyway, that was how I got started with the project. And, um, it's really just grown from there to the, the pieces that you see. I've got, Oh, I think it's 14 or something like that now. I think it's interesting that you work both really teeny tiny and really great big huge, both into <laughs> both into the spectrum. Well, 
one of the things is that Dan Peterson used to say is that God is in the details. And um, I love detail. I mean, it's just like, I, when I go see artwork, say at a, a gallery or something, um, the people that do just big pieces that are relatively simple, I may like them. But what I'm always drawn to is, oh, especially medieval art, where you see this beautiful detail work, it just kills me. And that's the kind of thing that I'm really, really into. So to do a tiny thing would be just like doing a section of a big painting. And my big paintings, my large work is loaded with detail. It probably keeps me from making the kind of money I should make as a muralist, but oh, well. Well, and and I but I also love the little river boats that that you do. The you know I love steamboats, uh-huh. and so I, I when I saw those, I thought I'm gonna have to get me one of those. Those are those are very cool. We'll have to fix you up with one. Have okay. Have you had the privilege of being on a steamboat? I have, you know, um, I was really fortunate that um, I was associated with a company that worked with the American Queen when they first pulled it out of dry dock, and my wife yep. and I got to go to New Orleans. <laughs> And spend the night on the uh, American Queen on when she was going to do her very first maiden voyage, but she ended up uh, blowing a rod or something, and so uh, we spent the first night on the dock in New Orleans. But heck, it was it was it was fun <laughs> anyway. Um, and so you actually um, you actually get to go. Do you go on many of the excursions and and on the steamboats? Over the years, I have I've played on river boats for the last nearly 25 years. And during that time, I've played on the American Queen, the Mississippi Queen, the Delta Queen, uh, the River Explorer, all of the boats that the American Cruise Line has. And, um, well, I've played on the Bella Louisville too, which was a, that was a treat. I've done, I've played on her twice and that, that's a special one. If you ever get a chance to go to Louisville and ride the Bell of Louisville, go in the wheelhouse. It is absolutely wonderful. It's, a, it's an old style wheelhouse because the boat was built, I think, in 1920 or something like that. And um, it has the liar's bench there where the old pilots would sit with the pilot. Um, it's the big wheel, the big eight foot wheel in there. And the time that I rode on it, the last time I wrote on it, I went on there with a friend of mine who was a, the pilot from the Julia Bell Swain, which was John Hartford's old boat. And um, anyway, we're going up the Ohio River. He turns to me, he says, Danny, he says, you want to drive? <laughs> and I looked at Kevin Mullins and I said, Kevin, I said, this is your boat. You're the one that's got to offer this to me. He says, go ahead. And so I stood there holding on to the spoke on that big old wheel. Man, I'll tell you what, you talk about a treat. Every time that engine would chuff, the old wheelhouse would shake like this. And, uh, oh, it was it was so cool. I felt like Mark Twain and and uh, John Hartford and everything all in one, one fell swoop. So we're going to talk about your uh, work with the banjo. Um, but okay. first, I want to finish. I don't want to leave murals yet because I'm really fascinated by the whole process. You know, we have a lot of big uh, walls here at Discovery Park of America, and there's one great big wall that Robert Kirkland always wanted a mural painted on. So mm-hmm. on the list of things to try to accomplish eventually are putting a mural on that wall. So I'd love does, to do it. <laughs> how does one start from your end? How do you start? Um, when someone approaches you with a project, what are the steps before the unveiling day where you show them the beautiful work you've created? Uh, it, the first thing I do is I sit down with whoever my client is and I try to get to know them. My, my biggest thing with all of my public work, all of my instrumental building work is to get a feel first of all for that person because public work especially more than anything is not about me i mean i'm going to come through it no matter what i do i can't help it but 
it's not about me at all. It's about that person, those people that I'm doing it for. And that's my primary concern there. So I need to know about them. What is the interest? What is, what is the ideas behind this whole thing? So I can start fooling with it. Then it really depends on the client. With the city here in Paris, uh, I usually paint a, a panel that um, is a small version of what I'm envisioning the uh, large piece to be. And then they'll approve that. And with the city murals here, what I've been doing is I've been painting them with a real high-end sign painter's paint on a, on a material called Renabond which is a composite material of aluminum, plastic, and aluminum. And then we mount that. Uh, I have painted murals on the sides of buildings, too. It's just really dependent on what a person wants. Uh, I'll take, and depending on how I have to do the design, the di designs, Lord, this is a hard question to answer because it's so many ways that I go about it. Um, but in general, say the last mural I did, I painted the panel and then I went in and it's almost like jazz painting for me is the way I think of it. I mean, it's, it's a very long improvisation on that particular design. And then I blow it up large and I can do it either with projectors or with um, greeting or whatever needs to be done. Now, um, years ago in my youth, I worked for advertising agencies and would have to stand up in front of suits and pitch an idea and explain what we were trying to do. And a lot of times I got good suggestions, but a lot of times I got suggestions that weren't so great. Do you experience, you know, when you're trying to do something so publicly vis visual, you know, do you get suggestions halfway through that you have to deal with? Do you have to be a diplomat when you're when you're doing these big public projects? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. You really do. That's that's a big part of it. I mean, any artwork, whether it's the big public work or whether you're selling your paintings in an art show, it's really all about connection. Um, I know a lot of artists who feel like it should be just purely about their work, but in general, when somebody's going to lay down money for your work, there is a, um, there's a connection that has to be made personally. Um, I have several friends who are great artists who don't sell hardly anything and it's because they don't have the ability to let the other person connect with them. I don't know how else to say it, but that's, uh, to me, that's, that's the whole thing. It's not like say Rembrandt today or Vermeer or somebody like that. We look at their work and go, Ooh, that's great. Or Picasso, whatever. We look at it and we go, Oh, that's wonderful. And we connect with the work purely with the work because that person's not there to connect with them also. But during their lifetimes, and this may be just my opinion of it, but during their lifetimes, I'm sure that they had to connect because if they didn't connect, they wouldn't have sold anything. And we wouldn't look back and go, Oh, look at that Vermeer. Look at that Rembrandt. Look at that Picasso. And then in addition to um, all these, you know, painting, little, big, all the murals, everything else you're doing, you also are a sculptor, correct? I do. I sculpt in clay usually. Yeah, I love, I love clay. And I saw some of your work. You, you, you do a great job at that as well. Oh, well, thank you. It's, to me, it's all the same thing. You know, if you're, if you can visualize, then it's just, the technical difficulties of whatever you put your hands to. 
so so you're obviously you know a well-known um, visual artist uh, in Paris, Tennessee, in a in what is a rural community. Um, do you feel like living, you know, not in Atlanta or you know in a big um, urban environment? Do you feel like that is is an asset or a detriment for your art art career? For me, it's an asset. It's been a it's been an asset. Um, both musically and and visually. Uh, I have artwork and instruments all over the world. And um, I feel I feel like I'm in a really unique and wonderful position in that I'm well enough known that I can make a living but I'm not so well known that it's bothersome. Yeah, that's and, great. And I was going to ask about that, you know, for working artists, you know, is it possible to make a living for young, young creative people who are trying to figure out, you know, whether or not they should move to, to, uh, the big city. Um, you know, we, we talked to a lot of really talented artists around here that go to the university of Tennessee at Martin. Uh, there are some, you know, in Dyersburg that I've talked to, um, but you obviously have been able to crack the code on making a living as an artist in a rural community. Well, it, for me, and it's only for me, I don't know how other people do it. I've, I've been one, I've been extremely fortunate. Um, the other part of it is I work really hard. And for me, a 10 or 12 hour day, six, seven days a week is, is the, it's what I do. You know, I just work. I like to work. Um, and I like, I'm always pushing myself. It's like with these murals, say the other day, Monday or Tuesday, when they had the unveiling of this latest mural, um, people were saying, well, this is the best one yet. And to me, that should be the nature of what we do as artists, musicians, is always be pushing to, to improve your skills, to improve your, what you're doing. And, um, and so I'm never happy with what I do completely. Um, for, since, since we're, um, uh, since podcasts are a, um, audio experience, can you, uh, paint for us a visual picture of this most recent mural that you just, um, unveiled in Paris? It's big. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) This, this one is 10 foot by 12 foot and in it, it pictures, because Paris, Tennessee is the catfish, fish fry capital of the world, or we like to consider ourselves that. Um, it pictures a large catfish that is floating in the foreground of this picture. And it really is probably the most important part of it. Also pictured in it is the east side of our courthouse square. And um, then it's populated by people from Paris. And one of the things I've attempted to do for the most part in this piece is even though I've painted very specific people and they are painted from photographs that I've taken is I have attempted to make them just enough oh, vague where people will look at it and go, well, that's, that's me or that's me or that's me, you know, so that they, they feel like they're included in it. That's something I have for the most part done with most of my work here in town. Um, One of the ones where I did something a little bit different that I'll talk a little bit about was um, the Voyage de Chronique, which was the first large mural in the large murals that we've done. And um, it pictures sort of Paris over time. And it's sort of a, like a quick overview. Uh, it has three courthouses and, and all sorts of stuff. But in the foreground are these two fellows that are standing there with their mules because back 
up to 1952, I believe it was, or 53, we used to have what was called mule days in town. And people would bring their mules in and show them off and trade mules and whatever. And anyway, there's these two black fellas with their mules that are in the foreground. And the picture that I did that from, I was just bopping through, you know, the internet one day and I saw this picture. And I thought, is that not the coolest thing? And I could see the courthouse behind them. And so I thought, well, I'll save that. I saved it. And um, when I was working on the design for that mural, I thought, well, you know, I need some kind of focal point in the in the foreground for this thing. So I thought, well, I'll use that picture. So I worked that picture into the mural because these murals actually are sort of like collages. You know, I'm cutting and pasting things together to, to get them. And uh, I was posted on Facebook. And up to that point, people had been interested in the mural, but all of a sudden there were a lot of people in this area who had family members who were those people. They knew who those people were. In fact, um, I had the granddaughter of one of those men talk to me when I was putting up this latest mural. And uh, anyway, when it was finished and we did the dedication on it that day, we had probably 100, 150 people there and fully a third to a half of that group of people were families of those two men. And there's a song that I wrote about Paris called My Little Town. And it was such a kick because I had a, a family, the Shepherd family, who've been students of mine, had two of their kids with me. And so we played My Little Town. And when I hit the chorus, people, these people who had never heard the song started singing with me. This, And it was such a, oh, unbelievable spiritual kind of, I get, I get good. I get my hair raising up on the back of my neck, just thinking about it, the shivers. It's, it's, it was an amazing moment. And that's to me, that's, what's great about the arts, no matter what you're doing. Um, there are those moments that, you know, yes. when you're, when you're working in the arts, there are yes. those moments that are, you can't explain you know, they're just magical like that. And they, you can't make them happen. You can put all the pieces in place and sometimes it just falls flat. But other times you have those moments where you get chill bumps and, you know, it, it, it's life changing. And you go back for it again and again afterwards. You don't. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to take a break. Um, but going out of the break, we're going to listen to some of your banjo tunes because when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about your uh, work um, in music. If you have not yet experienced Blue Bank Resort and its tasty catfish, handcrafted beers, and wide porch and patio on Real Foot Lake, then you need to start booking your trip now. Blue Bank Resort is one of the best spots for dining, cocktails, live music, and gorgeous sunsets. Visit bluebankresort.com for more information. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. Our guest today is Dan Knowles, and now we're going to talk a little bit about his banjo work. Uh, what was the song that we were listening to as we um, exited for the break? A Cure for Gravity is a song that uh, I wrote and recorded with my good friend Tim May from Nashville, and it was the song that I played on the Grand Old Opry the first time I was there. And uh, love it. So obviously you were an artist, a talented artist. You uh, loved art. And how did you end up also in music? When I was uh, seven, my daddy brought home my granddad's mandolin. It was an old Gibson A-style mandolin from 1905. And um, he played it a lot like the Blue Sky Boys. I don't know if you're aware of them, the Bill and Earl Bullock. And uh, so that was the way I learned to play mandolin. And I started playing mandolin with my daddy. And, and it was funny because he would uh, tell me, you know, don't touch this thing when I'm not here. 
Well, he knew me. And so when nobody was around, I'd go sneak in. I'd get that mantle and I'd practice it. And so one day, just before he passed, one day I was talking with him. I said, Dad, I said, um, you know, this is what I did. You know, when I was a kid, I, I said, did you know it? And he looked at me and said, he said, son, he said, you've got a son. And that's all he said. <laughs> and uh, so I'm quite sure he knew that that's what I was doing. But uh, we always had family get togethers and stuff. And, you know, everybody was playing music. My my uncles played. Um, grandpa played guitar and all. And, um, you know, it was just it was just what we did, you know, it wasn't a, a big issue. And so, uh, so I started playing mandolin when I was seven, got into high school. And during those days, the Beatles and the band and groups like that were popular and, um, nobody wanted a mandolin player. They, they, they wanted a guitar player. So when I was in, I guess, 10th grade or something like that, I took up the guitar and, and, um, that went along real good until I got into college and I had always wanted to play banjo because when I was a kid, we we're in California and there was this station called KRAK crack radio. And, um, at noon before they had the news, they would play, Oh, grandpa Jones or Lester flat and Earl Scruggs or somebody like that. And so I'd hear grandpa and I'd go, Oh, that's, I'd love to build it. I'd love to build to that. Well, um, my freshman year in college, I met um, a guy named Ed Korbizer, and Ed could play like that. And so I got Ed to show me how to do the basic claw hammer lick, and, and that started my banjo playing. I learned how to play the bluegrass style, too, but uh, that was not uh, that was never where my heart was. Well, I was curious, um, because you were out on the West coast, if, you know, like the Smothers brothers and, you know, th that type of music was any influence at all. Um, you and I are close to the same age. So I think, you know, you were probably on the other end of that, but, um, you know, also I know Steve Martin is a big banjo player. Now uh, I was wondering who your influences were out on the West coast with that style of music. Uh, grandpa Jones was my first big influence. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it was, it was, it was what I wanted to do. In fact, uh, after I got where I could play banjo reasonably good, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I used to do a grandpa Jones kind of takeoff show where I bounced around and the whole thing. And still when I'm out doing shows, occasionally I will, uh, I'll do my grandpa thing. Mostly. Grandpa Jones was the first big influence. The second big influence, of course, was Earl Scruggs, which is odd for a claw hammer old time player. And then the third one, oddly enough, was Bella Fleck. And um, and David Grisman, the great mandolin player, was also a big influence. And there was a lot of it, when I was coming up, there was a lot of those guys that were you know, they would tour out there and the California Bluegrass Association would have festivals and such. And, um, you know, we worked some of those things and all, you know, just did our thing. The Stanleys, the Stanleys and the Bullock brothers, though, when I was little were my big influences. They were ones that my dad loved, but my dad was kind of an odd music lover in that, well, he loved that old time stuff like that, which was his past um he also loved benny goodman oh wow and, and you'd hear my dad run walk around the house and he'd be singing and he would sing goodman solos and, and things like that because he he loved benny goodman that was you know the stuff with charlie christian and those things were his his thing when we were real little they um <laughs> they didn't know a lot about classical music, but they decided that this rock and roll that was hitting in the fifties with Jerry Lee and, and Elvis and all of that, um, that was jungle music. <laughs> and, and so, uh, that was not something they wanted us to like. And so they bought a collection of records from, um, the reader's digest. And it was a collection of classical records. And interestingly enough, I fell in love 
with um, pomp and circumstance from Sir Edward Elgar. I still, to this day, that's one of my favorite pieces of music. I can hear it. I went to my granddaughter's graduation the other night, and they played it about 50 times. And, and it still moves me at this point in time. And, and you'd think even played not the very best that it would uh, not affect you, but it still does. And so all of that, along with the rock and roll that I fell in love with in the 60s, um, everything just kind of feeds into it. And so my banjo playing is a really odd amalgam of things. And um, along that line, back 25, 28 years ago, something like that, I was helping a friend of mine paint his church. And I cut the first finger on my left hand and numbed it. And so I spent about a year not playing at all. And I had, I was working for WKMS as one of the hosts of their show music from the front porch. And so we went to the Tennessee state ban uh, banjo fiddle championships in Clarksville to record them. We were going to play them back over the air. And I ran into a little guy named Billy Lilly who eventually became a bass player in one of my bands. And uh, he was carrying a, an old August Pullman banjo over his shoulder. And I don't remember what the other one was he had in his hands. And I asked him about the banjo. And so he handed it to me. I was looking at it. He says, well, do you play? I said, well, I used to. He said, well, what happened? I told him. He said, well, your right hand works, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, yeah, I guess so. So we sat down and about four hours later, um, I remember that I was supposed to be out there <laughs> facing Grady Kirkpatrick and, uh, and, uh, that started it back up. Billy tried to get me in the state championship that time. And I was not able to, but, uh, I went home and built me a banjo out of parts. Cause I didn't even own a completed banjo at the time. I'd gotten rid of a lot of that. And I went to work on a whole new style of banjo playing. One of the things that Billy and I talked about later in the day is he said, wouldn't it be cool if as claw hammer players, we could do melodics like three finger banjo players do and not being smart enough to realize what an amount of work that was going to cost me to figure it out. Um, I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. And so I went home, built me up a banjo and went to work on trying to figure this approach out. And not the first year that I came back, but the next year I won the Tennessee state banjo championship. And it, it has gone on from that point to where I've won it eight times, which is more than anyone else in the history of the contest ever did. And then of course the national banjo championship too. That's incredible. Um, and it all came from you just diving back in and just trying and just jumping in and doing it. It's what an incredible story. Um, how did, so, so I'm assuming my question was going to be, what was the path to ending up at the Grand Ole Opry? I'm assuming that, you know, winning those awards is sort of what led you there. Yes, it is. Yeah. Mike Snyder had me on the Opry because of that. And, um, it was very sweet of Mike because he, he booked us to the Ryman auditorium, which is special to me. And, um, I, that was a, that was an experience of experiences. Oh, I can only imagine what, what that talk about chill bumps and hair raising. That's it. That's an incredible experience. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's wild. The, the one you talked about those chill bump things when I won the nationals, that was, that was one of those points in time. I had gone to the Murfreesboro to play it, and I, I didn't intend on competing that year. I was, didn't feel like I wanted to for one reason or another, and, and I ended up seeing a lot of people there that I knew, and I thought, well, I'd better do this thing just so that I don't hurt somebody's feelings. So I went up and did it and made the first cut going up there, just laughing and carrying on. 
and then went back to the second cut. And it was funny in the second cut. I, um, I play minstrel banjo too. That's banjo that comes from the 1840s, 1850s. It's a whole old, old style of banjo. And, um, I had, had had that with me and I, for my wife had my steel string banjo. And as I was getting ready to walk on, just before I was walking on stage, somebody said, well, you got to play two songs. And I thought I just had to play one. (laughs) <laughs> and so I looked out in the audience to see if I could see Debbie and she saw me looking. So she came up with my banjo. I got it out, tuned it up, walked up, played a couple songs, made the second cut. And I was playing for a playoff for the national championship. And I had no idea what to play. No idea at all what to play. I just, I stood back there backstage watching this other fellow working on the, uh, you know, competing against me and, and he was working so hard at it. And I was just thinking, well, I've got no idea what to do. And I walked on stage with still no idea what to do. (laughs) And (laughs) I saw all of these people out there who so many of them have been friends and just, uh, it was funny. I had this feeling and, and I, I thought I'm going to play home sweet home for these people. The funny part about it is I had never played home sweet home, never in my life. And so I sat down and I played purely from my heart. I played it slow instead of, you know, picking up and playing at 900 miles an hour. I played it slow and then I played it faster. And, um, and I remember just being up there, just nearly crying, playing it for people as a thank you for them being there and walked off stage. And, uh, one of the judges came up to me and he said, he said, Danny said, that was real nice. He said, but I'm sorry. And I said, well, well, Boge, don't worry about it. I said, you know, I didn't come today expecting to win anything. If I won second place, what's that's cool. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. So they started calling for the winners. And of course, when they do those things, they go third place, second, first. So I knew what I got. I got second place. So I got up on stage and the gal that was handing out the awards, (laughs) she calls out third place. And I knew who got that. She said second place. And I didn't even listen. I started walking across the stage to get my award. (laughs) And she looked at me like, you're the craziest sucker we've ever seen. (laughs) And gave it to the guy I'd been playing against <laughs> and then, and then gave me first place. And I was just, uh, <laughs> that's incredible. That's but, incredible. So, um, if, if anybody, if anybody who's listening wants to hear some of your playing, where's the best place for them to go? Do you have a YouTube channel or where should they find you? There's uh, stuff all over YouTube where you can find me right now. Um, since COVID, we haven't been performing out, but uh, we're beginning to work on some some things. So you can watch out for me, and I'll I'll be in your neighborhood sometime. Now you're so close to Discovery Park. Have you ever played at Discovery Park of America? I would love to play there, but I have never been. I've been there, but I've never played there. Well, we're gonna fix that. Um, Good. We did, we're we're gonna get you over here for sure. Um, because um, I love banjo music, and of course, it you know ties in really nicely with some of the things that we do here. So, um, I really, really appreciate you being on our podcast with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you having me. Excellent. We're gonna we're gonna uh, listen to some more of your music as we um, exit. But thank you to all of our listeners who've joined Dan, Emily, myself today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. dot com.